So I always like to uh, begin my talks with this slide because it's about my predecessors, the people who uh, influenced me during my training at Sloan Kettering. Um, on your right is Jerry Posner. On your left is Fred Plum. This is at the uh, uh, AAN meeting many, many years ago. And this is interesting because uh, Jerry started, um, my mentor, Jerry, on, uh, on your right, started um, the field of neuro-oncology in the United States uh, many years ago. And the story is interesting from a Seattle perspective because you're all undoubtedly aware and keep at your bedside a copy of the seminal work, Diagnosis and, of Stupor and Coma by Plum and Posner. These are the guys that wrote that, and they actually did the work for that book at Harborview. So way before they became uh, big deals in New York, uh, they were at Harborview. Uh, all of the coma data um, was developed uh, with, uh, you know, the, the folks who went to Harborview for that kind of a problem. And uh, Fred Plum, on the left, was recruited to be the chief of neurology at New York Hospital uh, on the Upper East Side, across the street from Sloan Kettering, and his sidekick, Jerry, uh, wanted to go with him, so they left Seattle and went there, and Fred looked across the street and he saw Sloan Kettering, a 700-bed hospital that's dedicated to cancer, and he said, Jerry, go over and start a neurology department at Sloan Kettering. And Jerry said, great, I'll do that, and that's how the field of neuro-oncology started in the United States. The Brits beat us to it by a few years, but uh, but that's, that's kind of where things got started. Now, these are characters, let me tell you. And um, Fred, uh, who I spent a lot of time with, um, Fred killed with his tongue for a living. He was probably one of the sharpest tongued, sometimes in a very ungodly fashion guy. He, I've seen him decimate speakers uh, after Grand Round. So Eric, where'd Dorky go? Don't even think about doing that right now. But uh, I've seen Fred uh, be really, really tough on, on speakers and grand rounds, for example, which was just astounding. And I don't know, 15 years after I left Sloan Kettering, the word went around the United States that Fred had been stricken by a condition called primary progressive aphasia, which is, if you will, a sort of focal form of um, neurodegenerative process, much like Alzheimer's, where you can't talk. You can understand. Uh, speech and language, but you can't actually talk. And it always struck me as he got worse and worse with that condition, how God must have looked down and said, all right, Fred, that'll be enough, you know? <laughs> and um, um, I saw him at a, they threw a huge party for him before he became too ill uh, to do it. And I shook his hand. He, know, he knew who I was, and he could not say a word to me. And so that, that's an interesting Fred Plum story. And then Jerry, uh, notice the wristwatch on his left arm, so he always wore his watch upside down, and he would do this when he wanted to tell what time it was. He had this little, this little mannerism where he would do this, and typically he did that when you were late, or if you were going on and on about a patient too long. I mean, basically, if you had three minutes to present to him, because we had, oh, you can't believe the workload there, uh, Jerry would be listening to you, and, and yes, yeah, and you knew it was time to wrap up. So that upside down wristwatch is really, really important feature. Jerry uh, is retired, but uh, still comes into work every day at 4 a.m., as he always has, for a little bit. He is the primary caretaker for Greta, his wife, Gerda, his wife, who has terrible Alzheimer's disease, and Jerry takes care of her. I think it's, uh, it's really sweet. She was a, a cabaret singer um, uh, for many years in New York, and Jerry is her caretaker. So, um, anyway, those... Those gentlemen were very important in my in my career, and um, I owe, owe both of them a lot. I want to start the talk by comparing three different kinds of diffuse astrocytomas of the adult cerebral hemispheres. And the thing that's remarkable about the imaging characteristics of these tumors is how the MRI features mimic the biology and the genetics that's going on underneath the, the formation and the growth uh, of the tumors. So as you can see here, the columns represent three different grades, grade two, three, and four. Grade one, of course, as you know, is a childhood tumor that we don't typically see in adults like uh, juvenile pilocytic astrocytoma, the cerebellum. That would be a grade one tumor. These uh, are grade two, grade three, and grade four. And let's start 
with the imaging features of grade two. So the first thing is, is that we have uh, T2 flares in the bottom row and post-contrast uh, T1s in the top row. And in that first column under um, grade two, which is uh, synonymous with low-grade astrocytoma, so don't ever get caught saying a grade two low-grade astrocytoma because people didn't know that you're not aware of the fact that those are synonyms. You don't want to get caught doing that. That's very embarrassing. And so uh, look at the flare image, bottom left-hand uh, uh, image. What you see is a mild expansion of the medial temporal lobe. It's a relatively well-circumscribed lesion, and that degree of T2 signal abnormality is typical for tumor and is not typical for vasogenic edema. So the first principle here on this is, is that when you have tumor without edema, it has this mild expansion with a little bit of hyperintensity, and compare the appearance over here. This is what vasogenic edema looks like. It's got fingers that go out into the white matter, but typically doesn't go into the cortex. This very bright signal is when you have leakage of tissue fluid into the brain, and that's edema. This sort of much less bright diffuse signal abnormality is typical for infiltrating tumor. And we can easily distinguish those two processes based on, on T2. The next thing is, is in the upper image, is, is that this lesion does not show contrast enhancement. And the important thing about that is, is that when astrocytomas feel the need for new blood vessels, those new blood vessels, as part of tumor supporting tumor growth, don't have a normal blood-brain barrier. Therefore, the contrast leaks into the brain tissue and does things that look like this and this. But low-grade astrocytomas do not show contrast enhancement because there isn't vascular proliferation going on. The tumors are mildly cellular. There's a low number of mutations in the, in the, in the tumor cells, and they don't quite grow fast enough to need new blood vessels. So that's kind of a, that's an important, that's an important set of sort of biological uh, features of, um, of the low-grade astrocytoma. And now compare that to a grade three astrocytoma. And the important thing here is that, again, we see this pattern of signal abnormality that doesn't look like vasogenic edema. It looks like infiltrated or tumor. Uh, and, you know, it infiltrates around the, form, the area where the tumor uh, first forms. And look at the pattern of contrast enhancement. So now we have uh, angiogenesis going on in the tumor. Again, those blood vessels leak contrast. And the important thing about the grade three tumors is, is that the contrast enhancement is, is uh, densely nodular, which is to say that it doesn't have a pattern of ring enhancement. So that, that uh, uh, homogeneous pattern of contrast enhancement is very typical for grade three tumors. Were you to see areas of necrotic change in a tumor whose histology comes back as grade three, we would no longer view that as a grade three tumor. Clinically, we would say, well, that's going to be a more aggressive tumor, even if the biopsy, which might be taken from a part of the tumor, the sampling bias problems, it looks like grade three histologically. Um, even if it looks that way, you've got to have no evidence of necrosis to be convinced clinically that this is going to behave like a grade three tumor. So we have uh, no edema here, although there is some contrast enhancement. It hasn't begun to really leak tissue fluid out into the brain. And so what happens basically between the grade two and the grade three form of these tumors is, is that the uh, number of mutations accumulate, the cells become, the tumors become more densely cellular, and because of that dense cellularity, now they need new, blood vessels, uh, need new blood vessels. But there are some interesting things to know about the presence and absence of contrast enhancement in, these, in, the, in the tumors. So first of all, the presence of contrast enhancement means in an astrocytoma means aggressive tumor. So if the pathologist tells you it's grade two tumor, but there are areas of contrast enhancement in it like that, we don't believe it. It's a bad sign for a low-grade tumor histologically diagnosed to have contrast enhancement. And so the absence of contrast enhancement here is consistent with low-grade tumor. If it, you know, did have contrast enhancement, then we wouldn't believe the low-grade part. The flip side of this is, is that the um, absence of contrast enhancement does not mean that it's a low-grade tumor. 
It's consistent with low-grade tumor, but if uh, you have a lesion in the brain that doesn't have contrast enhancement in it, that is not proof that it's going to be a low-grade lesion. And occasionally you'll hear people say, well, radiographically this tumor looks like a low-grade, we'll watch it. No, 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 you can't do that. One-third of non-enhancing masses in the brain like this are high-grade at the time of, of biopsy. So you can never, unless it's in the ponds and you can't reach it safely with a needle, we never, ever just watch these lesions. So I'll tell you a story about the patient whose scan, this is a uh, man I took care of many, many years ago at the Mass General, that left-handed scan uh, was in a patient with, uh, who was 56 years old, had the first seizure of his life, came in and had what appeared radiographically to be a low-grade astrocytoma. We biopsied it, it was a low-grade astrocytoma, and nine months later he died because this rapidly transformed into glioblastoma, became an enhancing lesion very quickly, and so the absence of contrast enhancement, particularly if you're over age 45, that's the break. 50% of the time, a non-enhancing tumor is high grade in people over age 45. And if you graph out the age relationship as you get older, the likelihood of a tumor being high grade, even if it looks low grade, goes up and up and up. And 45, it's 50-50. Age 45, it's 50-50. So the principle about why we always go to biopsy in these lesions, even if they appear low grade, is because we're wrong somewhere between a third and a half time based on, uh, on the age of the patient. Now, when we get over to glioblastoma, the um, radiographic appearance of the tumor uh, changes substantially. And what happens here is, is that now we've got this big area of central necrosis, and the theory behind the necrosis is, is the tumor outstrips its blood supply becomes centrally necrotic, and what you see is dead tissue in here when these are resected, and the contrast-enhancing margin is where the active tumor growth is occurring. And so if you were to do a needle biopsy on this, we would do more than that for this patient, but if you were to biopsy, you would want to get the margin of the tumor here. If you put the needle in the middle of this, you get dead tissue, and you can't make a diagnosis. So the ring-enhancing pattern here is very, very important. This is what we call geographic edge of enhancement. And I'll, I'll go through this in a little bit more detail in some subsequent slides to help you d distinguish between metastatic lesions and primary lesions. But what is happening here basically is that this tumor is growing along pathways in the brain. And so this pattern of geographic enhancement is typical for malignant gliomas and is very different than metastasis. There's really not much else that lesion can be other than glioblastoma. Because of that pattern of geographic enhancement, how irregular it is around the, the, the sort of margin, it kind of has dents and, you know, uh, uh, places that are growing out. The second thing about this is, is that now we have lots and lots of edema around here. So this is no longer that sort of mildly gray, bright appearing area. This, T2 signal abnormality now is very bright, and it is going along out in the brain. And one of the things that we know about these tumors is, is that because they're called diffuse tumors for a reason, and the reason they're called diffuse is because they diffuse in the brain. They infiltrate. In fact, there's uh, online you can find this, but there are wonderfully amazing photographs uh, at the microscopic level of glioma cells putting pseudopods out into the brain tissue and then the integrin receptors track along and you can see the cells crawling down white matter fiber pathways uh, under microscopy, time-elapsed microscopy. It's really quite striking. Such that by the time one of these tumors comes to clinical attention, it's already in the other side of the brain. It's already down in the conus medullaris. They are very diffuse tumors. And that's a very important principle and explains why it is that you cannot cure an astrocytoma regardless of how aggressive the resection is. You can have a frontal polar lesion, take a quarter of the front part, you know, the, the quarter of the brain out on the front side, and the tumor simply recurs in the other hemisphere about a few months later. This pattern of, of spread is, 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 uh, is very important and distinguishes from metastatic disease where the spread to the bone or the liver from, say, a lung cancer is what kills the patient. We can handle the lung problem, but we can't handle the spread into the body. Astrocytomas don't spread in the body, they spread in the brain. And so the thing that gets us in trouble is this diffuse infiltration property. 
And so, you know, patients say to me every day, they go, so well, what's the, what's the stage of my tumor? Well, we don't stage brain tumors because most, the vast majority of them, these in particular, the common ones, don't spread. So stage is where is it in the body? Grade, on the other hand, this is grade four, and again, that is synonymous with glioblastoma. And so this pattern of, of diffuse infiltration is very important. So we'll look at what's going on here. See this? This linear structure right here is the optic tract. This tumor is infiltrating up through the temporal stem into the optic tract, which is subpeal after it leaves, uh, comes out of the optic chiasm. The tumor is swelling the optic chiasm. And in uh, many cases, I've seen the tumor actually cross into the other temporal lobe by going across the optic chiasm, coming back down the other optic tract and into the temporal lobe on the other side. There are five ways that tumors infiltrate from one side of the brain to the other. The largest one, of course, is the corpus callosum. Then you have the optic chiasm, where the tumor can go around through the tracts, chiasm, tract, into the other side of the brain. You have the anterior commissure. There's the massa intermedia between the two thalami. Most patients have that, maybe half, not all. And then uh, the posterior commissure and habenula region is another place where the tumor can cross from one side of the brain to the other. And we simply assume that it's everywhere uh, by the time we, we uh, see the diagnosis. But here's a nice example. We can actually see it tracking across the, the, um, the corpus, the um, uh, optic chiasm. So the pattern of this diffuse infiltration is a critically important feature of understanding these tumors. And what is happening here basically is, is that Tumors begin life as low-grade tumors, and then they slide sideways to the right to become high-grade tumors. So four times a day when I meet a new brain tumor patient here at the hospital, people say to me, what did I do wrong? How come I got this tumor? What's the cause of the tumor? So we get the cell phone conversation out of the way. No, it's not cell phones. We talk about, uh, you know, various things. Can my kids get it? No. Uh, except in really rare genetic syndromes. So what is the cause of these tumors? Here's the answer. When DNA is replicating, every million base pairs, there's an error of DNA replication where a base gets transmitted or, or gets replicated and it's wrong. So you got your ACTGs and it's supposed to be very, it's very high fidelity, but there's a one in a million, that's six sigma. There's a one in a million error rate in base replication. And that happens across the genome. It's random. But if the mutation happens to hit a critical place in a critical gene that's related to growth, and now the brain, which basically is largely non-mitotic except for some, some uh, cells around the ventricle, the brain is largely post-mitotic. But if there's a mutation sitting in one of those cells, the cell has this urge to grow. And if it grows and you get another mutation per million base pairs, and that happens to hit another gene which helps the cell begin to think about growing, you, been, you begin to develop a brain tumor. And so the answer to why it is that these things form is errors of DNA replication. And, um, you know, when we look at the mutation pattern across the genes that we know that control all the features of the tumor, you can see that very clearly. You see mutations, most common ones by, I think, 95% of the DNA changes in a tumor like this are single base substitutions. So that's why the tumors form. It's an accident that probably happens during brain development. So you've got these little, each one of us has little sleeper cells sitting around here and there in our bodies that have mutations and the cells are thinking about dividing when they shouldn't. The theory is, is that each one of us develops a cancer every year. But because the mutations cause proteins which are not self, now the protein has not got the right amino acid in it, and the immune system goes, say, that cell's not supposed to be there, and the immune system comes in and it whacks the tumor. But if the immune system doesn't do that or some other things happen, then you can actually come down with cancer. And so it's, it's, a, it's a random process, uh, but it's really interesting to think about how these things sort of uh, come to development. And so what's going on in this slide basically is, is, I know they're different patients, but many times we can actually watch tumors go from the low grade type to the middle grade to the high grade. So this would be somebody who has a seizure when they're 20 and we find a low grade glioma, we take it out, we watch it over years, over a period of years, 
And then an area of contrast enhancement shows up in the tumor. Now they've got a high-grade tumor and the risk, of course, to their, uh, to their well-being in life uh, becomes very much higher. One of the interesting things about this mutation pattern as the tumors go from the left side to the right side is, is that you'd think that how nasty glioblastoma is, it's up there with pancreas. Pancreas cancer is actually worse than glioblastoma. Median survival for pancreas cancer is six months. We get 15 months. We're doing three times better than the poor GI guys over at, uh, at, at, um, uh, at SCI. But it's interesting. You would think that this is a hugely mutated cancer, and it's not. If you look at the distribution of average number of mutations by tumor, melanoma and lung cancer are the highest. Poroglioblastoma is sitting way down in the low mutation burden range of that curve. And so why would that be? Well, it's interesting because melanoma and lung cancer are both carcinogen-induced tumors. Sunlight, things that you breathe into your lungs, particularly if you're a smoker. And so this business about being carcinogen-induced means that there's lots of DNA changes that are being caused by carcinogen. You, you be light, as you know, forms uh, thymidine dimers. That screws up the DNA sequence. Very heavily mutated tumors. Our tumors are very lightly mutated tumors, despite their highly malignant nature. That has some really interesting implications. It's not that there aren't a lot of biological processes that are screwed up in these tumors. They're... they're they're basically at the limit of what a cell can tolerate in terms of abnormal biochemistry. But it's not through mutations. In brain tumors, it's epigenetic changes. So if you look at that, that, that pattern of mutations by tumor, the ones that are the most mutated, like melanoma and lung cancer, well, they have the most mutations per megabase of genome. Our tumors, the ones I deal with, um, have a low number of mutations, but if you look at things like DNA methylation and epigenetic changes of that nature, it's very high in these tumors. So glioblastoma is a very screwed up cell. It's as screwed up as it can get without the cell dying. If it dies, then it's no longer a successful tumor. So we get tons of epigenetic changes, not DNA sequence changes. We get tons of things like um, screwed up message, uh, messenger RNA processing, but we don't have many mutations. The tumors that have high mutation burden are the other way around. They don't have as many epigenetic changes. So there's this concept of the limit of what a cell can tolerate in terms of abnormal changes. Ours are from a slightly different process than, um, than other kinds of tumors. But the, the key principle that I want to come back to here is, is that these tumors are sliding sideways. As the cells divide in these, in these uh, tumors, they get more and more mutations, but it's not a high number of mutations, relatively speaking. So, that's the longest talk you've ever heard on one slide and probably ever will. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's a slide I've been using for a number of years because it helps communicate the principles of what's going on in these brain tumors. I, I think, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a very helpful slide to me to this day. So, let's say that you get called to the emergency room because a patient's had the first seizure of their life and there's a lesion, a mass lesion in the brain. So, let's talk about how to think about that. And um, here, are the four, here are the four things that, that really matter. Number one is have a clear understanding in your head of the list of possible things that can cause an, uh, a mass lesion in the brain. We're going to go through that next. Then you basically go in and you interview the patient and you look for clinical features. Do they have a history of metastatic cancer? Do they have this, that, or the other? We'll talk about that. You have to understand how the neuroradiology helps you distinguish between A, B, C, and D. And then at the end of the day, put all of that aside and biopsy something. So it's remarkable to me the number of times I see it happen in this neuroscience institute, not infrequently, where a patient will have had a week or two of intensive workup. They get lumbar punctures, cytologies, and whatnot, and um, they have a mass lesion, and my view of it is just get the biopsy, right? Because those other ancillary tests um, just don't get you there as fast as the tissue does. Now, on occasion, you'll biopsy something like an MS lesion that might not have had to have been biopsied. 
but I have done it many, many times. Maybe once a year we'll get a biopsy back where I thought something was a tumor and it isn't. We'll talk about how badly you can be tricked with this stuff in a minute. And when I go into the patient's room and I say, we got the biopsy results back and it's not a tumor, I've never had anybody say, so you biopsied my brain for no good reason. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> never had that happen, right? But they do do this. Right? They're like, yes. And I do that with them because uh, I don't want people to have brain tumors either. I, I, wish, uh, I wish I could put myself out of business. Differential diagnosis. Uh, of course, you know, my big interest is in tumor, and most mass lesions in the brain are tumors. They're obviously primary metastatic. We're going to talk about how to look at these in just a second. You can have an infection. Here's, here's a, a pearl. The most important thing that's happened in neuroimaging is the diffusion analysis of enhancing, ring enhancing brain lesions and the ability to know when you have an abscess and know when you don't because abscesses are deadly, rapidly, rapidly deadly, a very, very dangerous lesion. They're deadly and curable. And that's what you don't want to miss, right? You don't want to miss something that you can fix. Uh, but is really dangerous to the patient. So we're going to talk about how to assess abscess on MRI. These vascular lesions, I tell you, everybody can diagnose an acute stroke on uh, DWI immediately after it happens, but let two weeks go by and see the kind of changes that can happen on an MRI scan and how badly you can be fooled by a two-week-old stroke or a two-week-old hematoma. It, it still is, uh, you know, I mean, I've been doing this a very long time. 30 years, I hate to say. But, uh, you know, you, I get fooled by this occasionally. Tumefactive demyelinating lesions. We're going to talk about that. Inflammatory masses, sarcoid. And then there's this whole arena of post-treatment enhancing lesions, which is very complicated stuff. I mean, it's like there are a number of things that can go wrong after a patient's head surgery or radiation or whatever for, uh, for a brain tumor or some other kind of a problem is is really fascinating. So we're not going to read this, but it's in your slide set. And these are examples of the kinds of things when you walk up to the bedside of a patient with a newly diagnosed brain mass that you should be thinking about in your head. What are the nature of the symptoms? How long have they been there? Is the patient sick systemically? Have they been exposed to something? And interestingly enough, about 10% of people at some point in their lives before they got sick with whatever you're seeing them for will have had a scan for some other reason. Always look back in the record. It's amazing how often this happens. Always ask the patient, have you ever had prior imaging that can be really, really helpful in uh, understanding a newly diagnosed mass lesion in the brain? So, of course, you know, one of the big differential diagnoses is metastatic disease versus primary tumor. And it's remarkable to me how often neuroradiology reports, of which I've written many thousands, uh, put equal weight on primary versus metastatic disease. In reality, the vast majority of the time, we're really confident at the neuroradiology level of which it is. But it says could be metastatic disease, cannot exclude metastatic disease when the neuroradiologist knows for a fact that this is going to turn out to, you know, with a 99 degree uh, percent of uh, confidence that it's going to turn out to be a brain tumor. And let's examine some of those features. So you'll recall we made this big to do about the geographic nature of this contrast enhancement, how it has dents and little nod nodules on it and whatnot. This is the appearance of something that's growing in the brain. This is probably was a gyrus at some point right here. And that's just an old sulcus. And this would be another part, and it's growing down deep into the white matter here. That geographic pattern of contrast enhancement, that's not what METs look like. And so neuroradiologists shouldn't look at, that sli at the, a slide like that and say, the, you know, can't exclude metastatic disease. We can't exclude it. But you shouldn't weight it equally. By comparison, in the middle column, here's what a typical brain metastasis looks like. So it's round. It doesn't have that pattern of geographic enhancement. It is at the gray-white matter junction, but beware. This old nostrum that mets occur at the gray-white matter junction is bunk. They can occur anywhere blood vessels go in the brain. They can be in the corpus callosum. They can be in the pons. We see it every week. 
Now, they prefer the, the gray-white matter junction, and there's all these theories about, you know, the capillaries kind of, you know, meeting there, and we don't know why they go to the gray-white matter junction, but this is a metastatic melanoma, and it is, at the gray-white matter junction, it's typical, that is exceedingly unlikely to be a primary brain tumor. Now, one of the interesting things about metastatic disease is, is that lesions enhance before they cause edema. In gliomas, they often show T2 signal change, not edema. Remember that sort of mildly hyperintense area? They show T2 signal change before they enhance. In metastatic disease, it's the other way around. There is no such thing as a focus of T2 signal abnormality with no enhancement in it that's metastatic disease. I'm going to show you some really nice cases of that in just a second. Unless there's some problem, like the metastatic disease is hemorrhagic, and therefore you can't see the contrast enhancement because it's already bright on T1. But METs enhance. Once they become one centimeter in diameter, they begin to produce edema. So little dots of enhancement around without edema, that's fine for metastatic disease. A lesion like this that's two, two and a half centimeters in diameter, it's got to have, it's going to have edema. It will have edema. And you'll see people say this all the time. They go, there's too much edema here for this to be metastatic disease or the other way around. And I find it's about 50-50. Half of the world believes that edema predicts one and half believe that it predicts the other, and they're both wrong. It doesn't matter how much edema there is, so don't worry about that. Both of them can be highly edemogenic or not, not so much. So glioblastoma, biopsy proven, metastatic melanoma. Well, what about this guy over here? This is tough, right? So here we have two enhancing lesions. This one is just big enough to start causing some edema by the one centimeter MET rule that I just taught you about. This guy's got quite a bit of vasogenic edema around it. Neither of these really look like that fuzzy tumor, mild hyperintensity thing. They, you know, they look edematous. And um, I mean, there's no question about the fact that this is brain edema. And so, hmm, what's this going to turn out to be? Um, Fabulous. So um, it's tricky. Do you know that one-third of malignant gliomas at the time of diagnosis are multifocal? So here's another problem with radiology reports. It's multifocal, must be metastatic disease. Mm -hmm, no, no, one-third of this lesion turns out to be glioblastoma. This is multifocal glioblastoma at biopsy. I would radiographically bet that that's metastatic disease, but it is not. It is multifocal, meaning, you know, geographically separate lesions on imaging glioblastoma. And so it can be tough. When you look at the nature of multifocality in glioblastomas, there are some patterns which emerge. This is a paper that I wrote with a German fellow um, many years ago, and it's still in my drawer upstairs on my computer, actually, but, you know, the old file drawer phenomenon, right? And um, we never published, we sent it in once and it got rejected and we didn't pursue it. But this is a this is kind of cool thing. So look at the features. So here's the one I just showed you. This is two very distinct lesions. We know there's tumor cells in here, we just can't see them. All part of the same field of disease. Here's another pattern. Two very distinct enhancing lesions, left thalamus, left middle temporal gyrus, and on T2 they're connected. This is the tumor tissue marching across from the thalamus over the temporal lobe or vice versa. The arrows are free. Here's a third pattern, which is not so well known and was actually the whole point of the paper. And here's what it is. Here's your right, uh, a left temporal lobe lesion with T2 signal abnormality. Some of this kind of looks a little bit vasogenic, but it's largely infiltrating. And now, in addition to that, we have this posterior temporal lesion over here with an arrow that has no enhancement. You have to take my word for it. Don't look at this image yet. There was no enhancement in this lesion. So it's multifocal. This got read as probable metastatic disease. But the interesting thing is, is if you know the one centimeter rule, that you can't have signal abnormality without contrast enhancement in a metastasis, then this becomes multifocal glioma without question. That's what it is. You just, it's just what it is. 
And the, the reason that this pattern is so important is, is that when you go to design the radiation field, if you don't take this area into account, it's going to turn into glioblastoma just like this is down here. And then you have to go back in and try to, to retreat that with hot spots of where the beams overlap, et cetera, et cetera. Here, a couple of months later, this particular patient now had a spot of enhancement in the tumor uh, because we didn't include it in the radiation field. So this pattern where you've got an enhancing lesion with T2 signal abnormality, a completely separate area of T2 signal abnormality, that is typical for multifocal glioma. METs from melanoma, unique. Uh, they're often T1 bright before contrast. So here's pre-contrast T1, and here's post-contrast T1. So you can't tell whether that lesion's enhancing or not. This can be one of two things. This can either be blood, which is T1 bright, in certain stages, typically for a MET, and that's what this turns out to be. Or it can be the fact that melanin is intrinsically T1 bright, and if that turns out to be a heavily melanotic lesion, it can be T1 bright just because it's got melanin in it. And um, we published a, a, a nice paper on that many, many years ago. Um, this is the most important talk in the slide. And so uh, Dr. Gerke has got me for another five minutes here, and I probably will just go through. Uh, huh? Eight? Eight? Yeah. Um, so if you, um, if you don't have the slides, photograph this with your cell phone. It's that important. These are the four things that cause abnormal diffusion on MRI scan. And when applied to evaluating new mass lesions, this is fundamentally important stuff. So for those of you that don't talk DWI a lot, this is not, uh, you know, driving under the influence. This is diffusion weight and imaging. For those of you that don't talk about this a lot, very quickly, water moves around in the brain like Brownian motion. The biggest component of that is where it goes back and forth across cell membranes with the sodium ATP pump. A sodium ion goes across, a water molecule goes across. That's the way it goes. And so what happens is, is that there's this water that's moving around at the Brownian motion level inside the brain, and lo and behold, there are MRI sequences which can measure the rate of that water movement in brain. And it's really, really, really important. It's the most important thing about MRI scan. Now, we have DWI, which is where things turn bright when there's restricted diffusion. And then we have something called an ADC map, a parent diffusion coefficient map, where things that have restricted diffusion are dark. DWI is tricky. Edema is also bright, and that's too much water moving around in the brain. And strokes are bright because the water is not moving. So DWI has T2 effects in it, so it's bright when it's abnormal water, and it's bright when the restricted diffusion. And so what you have to do to figure that out is you have to look at this ADC map, and if it's dark on ADC, then you've got restricted diffusion. The water is no longer moving like it ought to, and that's what we're talking about in this slide. There are four categories of problems in the brain that cause restricted diffusion. And if you know this list, you can look at a DWI image and figure out what is wrong with the patient most of the time. So the most common cause of restricted diffusion by far and away is failure, failure of the sodium ATP pumps. Remember, sodium ions move, water molecule moves with each one of those sodiums, and there are two things that cause that pump to fail. Stroke or uh, loss of blood supply, it's instantaneous. When you lose oxygen to the brain, the sodium ATP pump fails and the area turns bright on, immediately turns bright on DWI. The other thing that happens is when you have a really severe seizure, that causes the cortex in this, around the area of seizure to turn bright on DWI and dark on ADC, and that causes restricted diffusion. Second category of things is dense cellularity. That's tumor. We've talked about that in this little set of images here. Third thing, certain proteinaceous states. So methemoglobin is one. That's a, one of the blood breakdown products. It's bright on DWI, dark on ADC. And importantly, this is where abscess comes into play. Bacterial and fungal abscesses have restricted diffusion. Toxo does not. And so this is, uh, this is really, really important. And um, we'll, we'll show you some couple couples, uh, examples of that in a second. Tissue vacuolization. Spongiform change. You can see diffusion changes in cortex, thalamus, et cetera, with Jakob Kreutzfeldt. And Rarely in diffuse axonal injury or acute demyelination, you can also see areas of restricted diffusion. So, failure of sodium ATP pump, 
dense cellularity changes water diffusion, protein changes water diffusion, tissue vacuoles change water diffusion, and anything that's got abnormal diffusion is going to be one of those four categories. That's why this slide is just really, really important in, in, in thinking about MRI. So remember I said that it's so important to be able to, you know, exclude abscess. And so here's how you do this versus tumor. This is metastatic tumor, small cell lung cancer. This is nocardia abscess. So what happens here is, is that you've got a cystic tumor with a nodule. Here it is on T2. This looks like, kind of looks like water, it is. And here's the densely cellular part of the tumor. And on DWI, it's bright where the densely cellular tumor is. And where the water is, it is not bright. And on ABC, this is the dense cellularity with restricted diffusion. And this shows elevated diffusion in the, in the cystic fluid. So in tumor, the restricted diffusion is in the nodular component and no restricted diffusion in the centrally non-enhancing part. In abscess, it's the other way around. So here's a nocardia abscess. It's got this little daughter abscess over here, which could kind of look like this tumor nodule. And when you look at this, when you see it on DWI, it's the central part of this proteinaceous muck in here with lots of neutrophils and bacteria and whatnot that shows the restricted diffusion, but not the nodular stuff. So when you see this, and there's a tendency to say, well, I think this patient might have a brain tumor, and you see this pattern, the patient goes straight off to aspiration, suck the pus out, figure out what it is, put them on antibiotics, and they live happily ever after. So... This slide shows you how to use UI in the differential diagnosis of a brain mass lesion. Here's another example. Darn, remember that geographic stuff I was talking about? This sure looks like a brain tumor. It looks like a tumor that's kind of U-shaped, and then that upper image, you're kind of cutting across it like this, so it looks like it has two lobes. This looks a lot like a glioblastoma. Mm -mm. You get the diffusion, you open it up, straight off to the OR to aspirate that thing, and that turned out to be a pyogenic abscess. Brain mets can have lots of little things. This was interpreted as um, multiple embolic infarctions. Not so. Open ring sign. This is key. Tumefactive demyelinating lesions. This is what's happening here, basically. Yeah. What's happening here, basically, is this is a sulcus. This is enhancement in subcortical white matter. So you get a, a little place where it doesn't cross the sulcus. And this is, uh, this would be typical, what would be typical? This would be a 25-year-old woman with a week of neurologic problems, a fairly acute onset, subacute onset, and you see this ring, open ring sign, and there's another one over here. Not all of the lesions have it. And this is what's happening. This is the, the sulcus going down in here, and that's why you get an open ring sign. We had this happen two weeks ago. Patient went on steroids, not biopsy, and got much better, um, although I biopsied a lot of those. Venous infarct, I'm almost done, Eric. Uh, venous infarct uh, is very tricky. This is the, remember this, and you'll know everything you need to know about venous infarct. Posterior left temporal lesion, what's happened here is patient has transverse and sigmoid sinus occlusion, thrombosis. This guy right here, that's the vein of LeBay. LeBay is lower, L. Trollard T is top. So what happens is this thrombosis this little guy, this cortical vein thrombosis, and you get this infarct. That, see that little white thing right there? That's the, that is the uh, thrombosed vein of LeBay, and it shows a mass lesion. It can be really, really tricky to distinguish that. Uh, if you, of course, if you see this cord sign like this, uh, you know, then you can, you can realize it's a venous infarct, but that's tricky. And then I mentioned the fact that there's all these post-treatment changes that can occur. We've written a lot, I've written a lot about this. Um, and, you know, here's uh, a tumor that got resected. There are three levels of transcortical vessels that come down to the ventricle. You're going to get some of those. Two-thirds of people after surgery have an infarct deep to the surgical margin. The thing about this is, is that it enhanced, look at that. Anybody would call that progressive tumor. Mm -mm, no, that's a few weeks later. That's contrast enhancement in a stroke. Hemorrhage can really obscure tumor, can make it very difficult to diagnose, and that will send you off to the break. Thank you.